The 3DO Interactive Multiplayer is a fifth-generation gaming console released in October of 1993. Utilizing CD-ROMs as a storage medium and featuring a 32-bit ARM-based processor, the console was a technical leap above the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo and was one of many players in a crowded video game market at the time. Of course, as everyone knows, the 3DO managed to sell only 2 million units, barely putting a dent into either Sega or Nintendo's market share, and would later be shellacked along with everyone else by the upstart Sony less than two years later. Retrospectively, the 3DO is often panned as one of the worst game consoles of all time. Cinemassacre named it the eighth worst console of all time in a 2013 video. Watch Mojo declared it the sixth worst console of all time. Finally, in a 2016 video, Dreamcast Guy named it the fourth worst game console ever. But to really determine if the 3DO truly is one of the worst consoles ever, one must dive into the library of games. Hardware is nothing without software, after all. So, rather than poke fun at a controller port, launch price, or Trip Hawkins' business strategy, I'm just going to play some games. Soccer Kid is a platformer developed by Chrysalis, originally for the Commodore Amiga in 1993 and ported to the 3DO the following year. Being a platformer, the story of the game is rather simple. While stealing the World Cup trophy, an alien pirate collides into a satellite, breaking the trophy into five pieces and scattering them about the world. It is then up to Soccer Kid to locate the five pieces and make the alien pay for his failed heist. Gameplay-wise, Soccer Kid is rather unique. Soccer Kid uses a soccer ball to perform all attacks. The player can manipulate the ball to hit enemies directly in front of him, as well as enemies in the air. Even better, it can be used to launch Soccer Kid to higher platforms. It's a rather unique gimmick, and while there is a learning curve, the controls are both responsive and intuitive. While the controls are unique, the level design is less so. Level layouts are mostly a linear left to right affair. In fact, simply beating levels is very easy. Instead, the challenge comes from locating the 11 cards hidden in each pair of levels. Completing this task will take the player to a bonus stage with a chance to earn a piece of the World Cup. Sadly, there is no way to revisit past areas to find missing cards, which is a shame. Still, even if one chooses to skip the cards and trophies, Soccer Kid offers a lot of game to chew on. Most of the five countries are broken into six levels, offering a massive amount of content to platform through. Each country has different themes as well. In England, for example, there are two suburban levels, two rural levels, and two metropolitan levels. While I wish the level structure was more varied, Soccer Kid does offer plenty of visual variety. Rounding things out, Soccer Kid is a decent looking 3DO game. While the game doesn't utilize the full color capabilities of the 3DO, the reduced indexed color mode results in a smooth frame rate, never wavering from a silky smooth 60 frames per second, somewhat of a rarity on the console. Many enemy sprites are also large and detailed, which I like. Better yet, the audio is excellent. Human enemies have clear sounding voice samples and the soundtrack is bouncy and vibrant. Get old, my lad! Soccer Kid is a surprisingly competent platformer with tight controls. However, the weak boss patterns, annoying enemy placement, and inability to revisit levels to find missed items needed to reach the final boss do prevent this from reaching the upper echelon of 2D platformers. Still, for 15 bucks, Soccer Kid provides a good value on the 3DO. If there was one killer app for the 3DO, Road Rash was it. Released in 1994, a year prior to the US launches of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, Road Rash does a brilliant job showcasing the power of the 3DO in the hands of talented developers, in this case, the electronic arts of all companies. Longtime fans of this channel know I've been a longtime fan of the Road Rash series, and this initial 32-bit offering just might be the best. The gameplay retains the arcade style 
style of 2D racers before it, while offering more complex and interesting tracks in addition to more on-screen traffic, making the game more challenging and therefore more engaging. In its day, Road Rash was most lauded for its combat element, allowing players to punch and kick rivals as well as steal weapons and attack with chains and bats. In 2018, it's the driving I feel makes this a compelling game I just can't get enough of. The five tracks are all lengthy roads, gently bending back and forth, putting a great emphasis on surviving opponents in traffic rather than memorizing turns, hitting apexes, and nailing braking points. Little touches like oil spills will temporarily make the bike slippery, and contending with this keeps the driving interesting. After clearing the first five courses, the player will need to purchase a faster bike. Level 2 then makes the five courses longer, and the increased speed of the upgraded bike makes everything a little more challenging. The long races and simple gameplay make Road Rash a very addicting game, one where an hour or two will melt away without one realizing it. About my only complaints with Road Rash are the sound and the difficulty. Road Rash features a fully licensed soundtrack, headlined by Soundgarden. Sadly, this licensed music does not play during the actual racing, only during the FMV cutscenes and menus. Instead, the player will listen to some simple chip tunes during the racing, which is a shame. The bike noise is also a little obnoxious and drowns out almost everything. On the difficulty front, despite playing this game for 22 years, I still can't get past the third level. The action gets a little too fast, and avoiding obstacles becomes pretty insane. Mistakes can also be hard to overcome, with a late race error often forcing the player to replay a lengthy track. I'd like to beat all five levels someday, but at this rate it will take me another 22 years. Still, the amazing FMV, tight controls, and wonderful sense of atmosphere make this one of the best racing games of its time, and it remains a blast to this very day. Out of this world, known as Another World in Europe, is a cinematic platformer ported to the 3DO by Interplay in 1994. The game started life on the Amiga and Atari ST in 1991 and was met with critical acclaim due to its radically different approach to visuals, storytelling, and gameplay. Playing it in 2018, Out of This World remains an enjoyable experience. First, playing the game is dead simple. So simple, in fact, the instruction manual is empty and the game contains no on-screen assistance. Right away, the player can do nothing but walk, run, jump, and kick, which are discovered organically by simply pressing buttons to see what they do. From here, the player is tasked with figuring out when to perform each action or die. Thankfully, checkpoints are generous and returning to the action is nearly instantaneous, not unlike many modern titles. The final gameplay element is a pistol, which is dropped by a guard early in the adventure. This alien buddy also also clues the player to this fact through some gibberish. The gun offers three functions, a normal shot, a shield, and a charge shot. These three functions must then be utilized to get through some of the tense firefights as the story progresses. Speaking of story, Out of This World is presented without text or dialogue, instead relying purely on visuals to tell its tale. While doing an experiment with a particle accelerator, lightning strikes a laboratory, transporting the protagonist to another world. The goal of the game is to then escape this place with the alien buddy Lester Befriends noted earlier. Other than this unintelligible gibberish, all communication with the player is of the non-verbal variety. This is made possible by the fact Lester, the alien buddy, and the alien enemies are all made from vectors, or polygons as the designer puts it, instead of sprites, leading to a wide variety of animation not normally seen at the time. On the 3DO, the vectors or polygons move at a reasonable frame rate with few issues. Unique to this 3DO port, as far as I know anyway, are the detailed backgrounds. Backgrounds. Out of This World is traditionally presented with simple backgrounds with geometric shapes matching the style of the characters. However, on the 3DO, they are painted backgrounds filled with detail. I personally enjoy them as they remind me of the painted backgrounds of cartoons of the era, and the simple vector characters contrast nicely against them. However, I can't deny Out of This World has some gameplay issues, namely the trial and error. The player is forced to drop down pits and hope for the best. Traveling the wrong 
way will result in instant death, and the gunplay is occasionally maddening, with thoughtful strategies being worthless in some situations. Still, like a classic film, Out of This World should be experienced as its innovations are still influencing games to this very day. Samurai Showdown is a 2D fighting game developed by SNK for their Neo Geo platforms and ported to the 3DO by Crystal Dynamics. Now, with Samurai Showdown, I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone. I'm not well versed in fighting games in general, especially 2D fighters, but I'll do my best to give a proper perspective from a novice. Samurai Showdown was a unique concept in 1993 as it focused on weapon-based combat, was slower, and had a unique feudal Japan setting. Everything from the art design to the characters to the music all follow this theme. Therefore, the dressings of the characters and the plethora of weapons are from this period in time. The gameplay itself uses a six-button setup, three buttons for kicks and three for slashes, each featuring a weak, normal, and strong attack. On the four-button Neo Geo, the strong attacks were handled by pressing two buttons. On the 3DO, one must hold the right shoulder button to access the three kicks. And this is where my biggest gripe with 3DO Samurai Showdown lies, as using kicks Kicks is very awkward, half the moves for each character are clumsy to pull off. There are no control options either, so one cannot remap the controls to better suit one of the six button controllers available on the system. Therefore, after many hours of gameplay, I settled on Earthquake as my most comfortable character. His best attacks are slashes, meaning minimal shoulder button presses are needed. He cannot be thrown due to his immense size, and a couple of his attacks do some serious damage. Even with these benefits, I cannot beat the game on the easiest difficulty. I personally found it hard to identify certain attacks of the opponents, meaning I would often attempt to counter too late or not be able to jump out of the way timely. Sadly, I'm just not wired for this type of game. Still, I did manage to have a lot of fun trying. The controls are extremely responsive, and Earthquake always performed the actions I requested, making for a fun time, even though I'm terrible at the game. Even better, the graphics are terrific, with large, colorful sprites, detailed backgrounds, and most impressively, full screen scaling. Just like the Neo Geo original, the sprite zooming is retained in this 3DO port, helping to push this one past its 16-bit counterparts. I will say the frame rate is at times choppy, but it's never too distracting and doesn't hamper the gameplay of this slower paced fighter. It's hard for me to recommend this game due to my lack of familiarity with the genre and the clumsy controls, but as a technical showcase for the sprite pushing power of the 3DO, this one is worth a look. <laughs> Road and Track presents The Need for Speed is the first game in the long-running Need for Speed series, debuting on the 3DO in 1994. Opinions on this game are understandably mixed. On the surface, the game is very thin. There are just three tracks total, each with just two or three sections depending on the difficulty chosen. Granted, these are 15-minute monsters offering a lengthy travel, but there is a noticeable lack of variety. Next, there are just eight cars, ranging from American Muscle to Italian exotics. My main issue isn't so much the lack of variety, but the lack of things to do. None of the cars are equal, meaning racing against X-Man rarely provides the experience of racing against a skilled opponent. That isn't to say some tight racing is impossible, but last second passes for the lead are often the exception rather than the rule. However, what the need for speed lacks in content, it makes up for with charm. X-Man is the star of the show here, with a ton of terrific FMV and the antagonist either chastising the player's lack of ability or humbly admitting defeat. It's cheesy, it's corny, and it's absolutely a product of the 90s FMV craze. They just don't make them like they used to. Also charming are the simplistic polygon car models. Unlike Road Rash, which used digitized sprites, the Need for Speed features fully textured polygon models for both the player and opponent as well as other traffic. The upgraded presentation is excellent and really showcases the types of experiences the 3DO is capable of offering in the hands of ambitious programmers. 
The polygon car models also aid in the collisions, which feel very natural and predictable. I suspect it aided in the controls department as well, with the game going for a more simulation style gameplay. Acceleration and braking seem to match the car's real world counterparts. The steering on the other hand, I'm not so sure. First, it is somewhat laggy or delayed. This usually doesn't matter much as these aren't technical racetracks, but rather winding roads. While each car is definitely different, with the Lamborghini being quick to spin out and the Porsche far more planted, I'm not sure I would call the steering or grip realistic. On top of the leggy controls and realistic speeds is a sluggish frame rate. The combination of the three makes for a racing game often lacking in excitement, which will definitely be a turnoff for Sim. Myself, I still find the need for speed to be a worthwhile romp. I love the overall lazy pace and the fantastic FMV. Your mileage may vary for sure, but there is little doubt this is definitely one of the titles defining the 3DO. Alone in the Dark is another one of those influential games which really should be played by gamers of all ages. Originally a DOS title released in 1992, it was ported to the 3DO by Chrysalis in 1994, but never made it to the PlayStation or Saturn. Alone in the Dark was innovative for two main reasons. First, it successfully utilized 3D polygons in a way accessible to owners of low-end PCs. Second, it evolved the point-and-click genre forward and utilized the limitations of the day to spawn the survival horror genre. As one can no doubt see, the main character in the game along with select items and doors are rendered polygons, while everything else is a static 2D background. This technique would also be utilized in PlayStation games like Resident Evil and Final Fantasy VII. This gave developers the freedom to utilize different camera angles to hide things from the player, building tension, allowed them to focus the player's attention in desired areas, aiding in puzzle solving, and allowed for character animation not possible with sprites. The walking animation cycles and the way the hero gets bigger as she or he nears the camera offers a terrific sense of 3D space, despite the limited hardware. While a technical marvel and innovative, the gameplay itself is decidedly more dated. As with most early Early 3D games, Alone in the Dark utilizes tank controls to maneuver. This means up on the D-pad always moves the character forward, no matter the relation the character is to the camera. While more fluid controls aren't needed during the adventure, it definitely gives the game an early 90s feel. The combat is equally cumbersome. Kicking or punching enemies feels delayed and the hit detection isn't the best. Things improve later on in the game with weapons increasing the hero's range, but shooting the rifle or pistol always feels imprecise. Thankfully, combat is not the focus of the title. Instead, discovering the mysteries of the haunted mansion's dead owner is the name of the game. The player starts in the attic, and then must escape by solving puzzles. A sinister plot is always slowly revealed, giving the player a final boss to defeat. While I thoroughly enjoy this game, even I must concede some of the puzzles are extremely obscure, and this one is probably best played with a guide. Adventurous gamers will be met with a fun little adventure, with a great atmosphere and a decent story. This 3DO version also features voice acting and an orchestrated score which offer a nice upgrade over the original game. The 3D graphics and terrific score definitely make this one of the better 3DO games available and one I highly recommend. Slam & Jam 95 is one of the few 3DO games that is both a system exclusive and pretty good. This is a basketball game developed by Crystal Dynamics and released in 1995. It does lack an official NBA license and contains no real world players, but in some ways this has helped the game age better without the baggage of retired players and relocated franchises. The name Slam & Jam would suggest an NBA Jam styled arcade dunk fest, however Slam & Jam instead that offers a more realistic approximation of basketball while still offering easy pick up and play game mechanics for non-sports fans. 
First, I should talk about the presentation. Slam and Jam 95 presents a long view of the court, rather than a side view. At this point, I'm not sure I have a preference either way, but the elongated view does allow the player to have a better view of all 10 on-screen characters, which I do like. It also allows for a ton of sprite scaling. Players scale smoothly from the back of the court to the foreground, giving a great sense of depth and easily communicates to the player where their teammates really are, despite characters ranging in size. In fact, the entire presentation is ace, with a smooth looking court expanding and contracting as the camera pans around, and tons of transparency effects in the billboards and player shoes, giving the wood floors a shiny appearance. The gameplay itself matches the slick presentation. Characters respond quickly to user inputs. The computer was always intelligent with my passes, passing the ball where I was expecting, and the shooting feels smooth. If one is too quick or too slow with their shot, it will miss. Releasing the button at just the right point is the name of the game, and the subtle timing feels great. From long range. Yes. Dunking also feels satisfying, but is noticeably more tame than other arcade games. Still, pressing the shoot button while driving towards the basket will produce a well-animated slam dunk, helping the game live up to its namesake. About the only complaint is the defense. The teammates will never go up for a rebound and rarely steal the ball. I assume the developers wanted the player to always switch to the teammate nearest to the ball and perform defensive actions themselves, but I would have appreciated some assistance. Rounding things out is the audio. There is no background music, but the announcers, crowd noise, shoe squeaks, and constant dribbling of the ball set a perfect atmosphere and I honestly have no complaints to speak of. Of all of the games in this video, Slam and Jam 95 is the closest thing to a hidden gem available on the system. It's an exclusive game I've never heard anyone talk about, the gameplay is easy enough to learn while still offering a ton of depth after hours of play, and remains reasonably priced. If you're looking for something different on the 3DO, Slam and Jam 95 just might fit the bill. It's tail time! Gex is another 1995 release from developers Crystal Dynamics. As best as I can tell, this was the last Hail Mary for the 3DO, a AAA platformer meant to push hardware into the homes of millions. Unfortunately, Gex wasn't enough to save the 3DO from its ultimate fate. But that doesn't mean Gex isn't a terrific game. In fact, quite the opposite. Gex is easily one of the best third-party 2D platformers of all of the 90s, rivaling 32-bit juggernauts like Rayman and to stall. But first things first, Gex is a stereotypical 90s mascot, packing Tude. After being kidnapped and transported into the media dimension, Gex must find TV remotes scattered about different media-themed levels to unlock new levels and new worlds. The worlds are all diverse set pieces loosely based on stereotypical TV themes like horror, kung fu, and cartoons. Unlike the previously mentioned Soccer Kid, Gex runs in full 24-bit color, offering a level of detail not available on fourth-generation consoles. The backgrounds and set pieces truly look outstanding with a hand-drawn, cartoon-like aesthetic that holds up today. As good as the visuals are, the gameplay is absolutely awesome. Gex is a gecko and the developers did a terrific job making Gex feel like such. The best feature is the ability to climb up walls, on ceilings, and even over certain background layers. It gives the Gecko a unique moveset and really helps the game feel sufficiently different from the hundreds of other 2D platformers released around the same time. The power-ups are also terrific. The player can either swallow the power-up using the tongue attack or tail whip it and instead refill a unit of health. Skilled players who don't take damage will be able to store power-ups as well, as shown next to the life bar. The power-ups range from the usual invincibility and speed to helpful like life bar extenders or can give Gex projectile attacks like fire, ice, and electricity. The smooth controls, unique moveset, solid power-up system are further enhanced by some great level design. Almost nothing in Gex surprises the player. Instead, off-screen obstacles are telegraphed, enemies are well positioned, and unique stage hazards are presented to players in logical ways. Gex offers a terrific challenge without ever being cheap, and the difficulty curve starts off easy and then escalates to hard as the game comes to a close. Unfortunately, the frame rate is pretty choppy, 
and it only gets worse as the adventure wears on, making it difficult to recommend when the PlayStation version is both cheaper and smoother. Still, if you're looking for a marquee 3DO game, Gex is near the top. BC Racers is a Mode 7 styled racing game developed by Core Design and released in 1995. I've previously played this on the Sega 32X and was never a fan, but some have told me the 3DO port is superior so I was looking forward to taking this version out for a test drive. At its heart, this is a Mario Kart clone set in the Chuck Rock universe. After choosing one of four championships, the player can choose one of six different teams with attributes for acceleration, speed, energy, and and attack power. Then the 8 race championship begins. First, let me talk about some of the things I enjoy about BC Racers. I like the damage model here, represented by a dinosaur going from alive and green to a skeleton. At the start finish line is some meat, which will replenish the health. If one fails to maintain their health, they lose the race. The player also earns a turbo after completing a lap, which can be strategically utilized on straightaways or the final lap to aid in victory. I also really dig the eight different themes. There is a prehistoric city, a night court, desert, jungle, swamp, snow, cave, and volcano theme tracks. Depending on the difficulty or championship chosen, the levels will be different getting more complex as the difficulty is increased. Finally, the soundtrack, which is percussion heavy, sounds excellent, really capturing the caveman vibe of the rest of the title. Unfortunately, while the game concept and themes are pleasant, everything else about the game is awful. This starts with the controls. The steering is bad. The buggies will change the direction they are facing, but the actual turning doesn't begin for a second or two. The player can press the down button for a tighter turn, which helps but this is awkward to use and still not precise. I would have preferred the shoulder buttons to be utilized for tight turns, but it wouldn't fix the underlying issue. The poor turning makes many of the tracks impossible. Littered throughout are ramps, which must be hit in order to jump over obstacles like water or lava. But as the steering is so bad, it is all too easy to miss these, virtually assuring the player will fail the race. In fact, I still can't get past the medium championship despite many years of trying. And then there is the frame rate. To put it lightly, BC Racers is choppy. Combined with the poor steering and BC Racers is almost unplayable. I'll forever be baffled how Core released such an abysmal product on both the 32X and the 3DO, considering Core's reputation at the time. But man, this game is a stinker. Stay far, far away. D is a survival horror game developed by Warp and released in 1995. The game opens telling the story of Richter Harris going mad and murdering everyone in an LA hospital. His daughter Laura hears the news and rushes to the hospital to investigate. Upon entering the hospital, it morphs into an old castle and the adventure begins. Much like Alone in the Dark, the player is tasked with escaping the old building by collecting items and solving puzzles. Laura begins with just a pocket watch and a makeup comb Compact. After opening the compact, the mirror shows an image of a dresser, giving the player the first clue on where to go. Unlike Alone in the Dark, D is almost exclusively an FMV game. Pressing a direction on the D-pad will set Laura off in a direction which plays out as a movie. While slow and plodding and void of meaningful player interaction, the first person perspective does a decent job giving the player a sense of where they are and navigation is not confusing at all. Speaking of navigating, reaching certain points in the castle will trigger cutscenes where Richter slowly reveals the plot to Laura. D then becomes a true survival horror game, with Laura using items to progress and solving puzzles before the clock strikes midnight, while the horrors of her family's curse are slowly revealed. While I'm not usually a fan of FMV games, D somehow works for me. The slow movement offers a certain sense of suspense, and one never quite knows what is going to happen next. The puzzles aren't as obscure as 
as other games of the era either, making this somewhat easier to play without a guide. While a short game, with my playthroughs usually lasting just 90 minutes, D does have some replayability in the form of these beetles. Upon completing the game, the player is shown how many of the four beetles were discovered, with an end title card urging the player to try again. While recording footage for this video, I was able to find all four for the first time and complete this game proper. Anyway, these beetles are scattered all over and won't be in the same place with each playthrough. I assume this is based on the time and certain other actions, but I've located eight different hiding spots in all. Finding them offers flashbacks from Laura's past, which is both disturbing and wonderful. All in all, D is an awesome example of what an FMV game should be. It never attempts to do more than what is capable from the gameplay style and has a delightfully creepy atmosphere. If you're a fan of FMV games or 90s survival horror, D is an absolute must. Tripped is a puzzle game from Warp, the company behind D. This is a typical block dropper where the player is tasked with rotating pieces and then dropping them to form contiguous groups of four or more to clear them out. The main goal is to continue clearing blocks, preventing them from overflowing the top of the board while scoring points. Simple stuff. Trip does have a few unique hooks, however. If one forms a square with the blocks, it will create a large alien rather than clear the blocks. If one then clears the large alien, they'll be rewarded with the game bonus, usually involving clearing other blocks. After scoring enough points or clearing enough blocks, I'm not certain which, the game will level up and get a bit faster. Each level also gets faster during the round, with the end of each being insanely fast. For better or worse, after leveling up, the game slows back down while clearing a couple of rows. Unfortunately, the reduced speed and cleared lines makes tripped rather easy and going on hour-long marathons is fairly common. Thankfully, the multiplayer does add a touch more depth. Here, the name of the game is forming aliens and then clearing them which will harm the opponent's board state. Whoever can screw their opponent the fastest will usually win, with damage mitigation also becoming a gameplay component. There are also plenty of difficulty levels when choosing a computer opponent, making this mode far more engaging than solo play. While I like the bouncy music and strange warp style, Tripped is mostly average. There is some inherent depth to the gameplay, strategically placing blocks, leaving oneself outs to undesired blocks, and successfully setting up large combos, but Tripped is missing the easy to learn, hard to master, gameplay better puzzlers like Tetris, Dr. Mario, and Pack Attack achieve. Perhaps it's the lack of a real punishment for sloppy play I find undesirable. Tripped doesn't really capture the tension of being on the brink of failure like other puzzle games. Still, this is a decent 3DO exclusive with colorful visuals and a nice audio presentation. If one can get this one for cheap, it's worth a look. That was amazing. Kiss me. Siberia is an adventure game released on the 3DO in 1996. Despite being a late release game for the system, the gameplay feels more like a 1993 launch title where developers were still wondering what to do with the CD-ROM format. The game tries to tell a cyberpunk story where the player follows the anti-hero Zack as he sneaks his way behind enemy lines to discover the truth about a super weapon virus. Unfortunately, while the voice acting is rather good, the gameplay is like a hodgepodge of every terrible FMV concept one could imagine. This includes clumsy movement, where the player chooses a direction and then watches the events unfold, but because the view is third person, it's difficult to understand where to go. Siberia includes quick time events, but does not include an on-screen guide so it's confusing on what input is required of the player. The puzzles range from interesting, like this voicemail telling the player to look at the poster, the poster being an obvious historical figure, which is then the password in this terminal, to confusing, like all of these logic gate puzzles. The fun doesn't stop there though, Siberia features a ton of on-rails FMV shooting segments. The problem with these is it's never 
obvious where the camera is going to pan, making keeping the cursor near an enemy a tough proposition. I've had better luck with this gameplay style with a mouse, but to the best of my knowledge, Siberia doesn't support the 3DO mouse. Worst of all are these cover-based shooting segments. The player needs to hide behind an object and then come out of cover to shoot, get the timing wrong, and one dies. These are incredibly sloppy and like the rest of Siberia, void of any enjoyment. Overall, Siberia is a poor title. The pre-rendered graphics look dated, lacking the charm or artistic value other games of the genre provide. The controls are confusing and unresponsive. One has to rotate the character before moving in a desired direction, for example. The trial and error gameplay is tedious. The puzzles are confusing and the FMV shooting stages are insanely frustrating, usually consisting of a brief moment to destroy a mission-critical target with failure resulting in a complete do-over. If you're into bad FMV games, Siberia might be worth a look, and I do appreciate the generous save points. For everyone else, stay far, far away. You guys still dead? So, after looking at 12 3DO games, which is just a fraction of the game's library, let me offer my closing thoughts. While the 3DO was a commercial failure by any objective measure, calling it one of the worst system ever seems misguided. Looking at the game library, it's clear there were some real gems here. Why else would games like Gex, D, The Need for Speed, and Road Rash be ported to the PlayStation and Saturn? If these games were bad, logic says the developers and publishers would not have bothered with the effort. Additionally, some of the PC ports live on to this very day. Alone in the Dark is available for modern operating systems and good old games. Out of This World continues to be ported to modern consoles, with an HD version available on both the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. While the 3DO's library pales in comparison to the mighty PlayStation, iconic Nintendo 64, and quirky Saturn, calling the 3DO one of the worst systems ever is just repeating the same narrative that has persisted for the past decade. While the 3DO interacts Active multiplayer will probably always live in infamy for its absurd launch price and colorful CEO, the game library presents a different narrative. The 3DO was a failure for sure, but one of the worst game consoles ever? The games suggest otherwise.